So what we're actually looking at here are two, what we're looking at here are two galaxies with lots of gas that are colliding. So it's actually showing in real time some of the time steps I showed you before. And uh, in this case, there should be a black hole in the center. So you can sort of see what's happening. You see these large streamers that some of this gas is being thrown out to large distances. But a lot of that is actually reaccumulated because of the, uh, um, um, the, some of the two galaxies, the gravitational potential is so large, it's just pulling out or pulling in all that gas again. And you can see now that um, a lot of the gas is heating up. You see that by the green here. And that's uh, because the black holes in the center are active. Black holes, when they have matter falling down on them, they spew out lots of energy. Okay. You want to see it again? kind of fun, some of the, this particular galaxy kind of seems to show sort of spiral arms, right? So right now they both have lots of cold gas, but now in the final embrace, in that final ding it, a lot of that coal gas is just heated and blown away. <laughs> Again, I'll, I'll show you later, okay? So I want to make sure that we, uh, the ones, those of you who actually want to uh, leave on time, you manage to do that. Let me see, where, where's my cursor? Is that a bird? What was that? Is that a bird? A bird? Is Yes, it's actually a birth of a new galaxy in that sense, right? You have two, old ga uh, two other galaxies that are colliding to uh, make a new galaxy. So that's in a sense is a birth, yes. A rebirth, I guess. But then it becomes an infrared-side galaxy, star-wise. Say again? Does it then become an infrared-side, star-wise, maybe, galaxy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, it cannot form stars anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Technology. I lost my cursor. Okay. So another another reason that we're interested is uh, a lot of galaxies sit in clusters, right? And some of these clusters in the very center, so you can actually have clusters of galaxies that have thousands of stars, or stars, oh, I'm sorry, galaxies. Well, so these clusters are just like a galaxy of galaxies, right? a huge entity of galaxies. And in that cluster of galaxies, there's a lot of gas. It's very hot, and it's uh, so hot it's radiating in x-rays. And this is actually an x-ray image. So it's showing the surface brightness. It's showing how much light is coming out in different parts of the galaxy in uh, x-rays. But the interesting thing is what people have found in some of these uh, clusters of galaxies is that there are holes in that distribution, as if somebody actually was pushing around the uh, X-ray gas. Now we know that some of these um, clusters of galaxies, well, they have um, some powerful radio galaxies in the very center. So that means that it's a galaxy that has a black hole that's active and is blowing out these huge jets of uh, material this is what we see here, radio plasma coming out, and it actually fits like hand in the glove, showing that these jets are actually just pushing around that x-ray gas. And what, one thing we're finding here is that you can see this is maybe along one axis of the, of the radio jets. This seems to show another one. So it shows that actually we also have both the black hole can affect the environment in these clusters. It can heat the gas to make sure that some of this gas that cools would otherwise form stars. And we, what we're seeing is that if we were to count all the stars and compare with how much in the cooling radiation, if we compare that and say, OK, so much, so much is cooling, therefore we expect so many stars to be formed. Yet we've seen less stars being formed. And it's been a puzzle for many years, actually, until they dis discovered these bubbles in the x-ray distribution of the gas. 
or the, the distribution of the X-ray gas. That's showing that, that the, uh, this radio plasma that's coming out from the jets is being pushed around, it's being heated. And we can actually explain now by just looking at the heating budget, just looking at the energies and saying, okay, this, this jet, this black hole is giving some feedback. It's actually heating the gas around it. It's pushing around the gas as well, but it's helping to heat the gas such that not all that cooling gas forms stars. So the fact that we see black holes affect the environment in galaxies and in clusters of galaxies makes black holes actually a very, very uh, hot research topic. Because we're hoping by studying black holes and how they interact with um, the galaxies and the clusters of galaxies, all the mass structures in the universe, we're hoping that we can learn something about how mass structures form and evolve across cosmic times. That brings me on to the point of what is really a quasar. Kind of already alluded to the fact that they have black holes in the center. So one thing is, if we were to look at um, an active galactic nuclear, that's a nucleus is actually a lower luminosity quasar. And if we were to look at these two images, it kind of shows what an Asian it really is. You have a galaxy here. It looks, just looks like a normal spiral galaxy. You have another galaxy over here. It kind of looks like a normal spiral galaxy. The only difference is that right in the center, there's a very, very bright nuclear source. Okay. So it's a galaxy with something bright very much in the center, and we now know it's because of this black hole. If you look at the radiation, you find that this is not because of stars, but it's actually because of a black hole that's accreting matter and is spewing out lots of energy. Now, these sources are actually really, really rare. There's not that many of them, so if you were to count among all the very brightest galaxies, there's only a very few percent of these galaxies that are active, that have an active black hole. I just told you most galaxies have black holes, so only a few of them are active. Uh, so maybe that tells us something about, in the lifetime of galaxies, they're only active for a very short time. If they were active for a very short, long time, then we'd see many more active black holes, many more active galaxies. So the quasar is really just one of the most massive part of these, this um, uh, population of galaxies with an active black hole the most luminous ones. And in the case of a quasar, the nucleus is so bright that often you can't see much more than just the nucleus. It's so much brighter, it can be up to several thousand times brighter than the galaxy itself. So when you look at uh, an image of a, a quasar, it just looks like a star. But if you were to take a spectrum, then you see something different. Now, we don't actually, we're not actually able to um, resolve spatially, what's happening in a quasar or an active galactic nucleus, because even the nearby ones uh, are so small, we can't resolve them. Because as I told you earlier, the whole system here is about the solar system size. They're very small. So what we're thinking, kind of know now, there has to be a black hole, because the power of these sources is enormous. The only thing we can think of that can give us variations uh, from some of the matter about to fall onto the black hole on, on light hours, on time scales of light hours, it means that we see the, the stuff that's actually varying in amplitude within just a few hours. It means that the, the region that's uh, varying is only light hours across. It's very, very small. And we only know of black holes that can do this for us. Or for us. Now, when matter comes in from the galaxy, as I showed with the, these stars that are moving around, as you also know from comets, when they come in close to the black hole, they go fast. They have too much energy, so they come out again. Now, in order for matter to fall onto the black hole, we need to remove a lot of that energy. And the way to do it is, um, well, we know that's what, so what happens, is that the matter falls into a disk that's rotating around the compact object. And that's exactly what we see in stellar objects, too. That this matter falls onto this uh, disk, and then the different analyte, the different parts of the disk, rotate at different speeds, so in the very center it rotates faster, just like the comet rotates faster when it gets closer to uh, the sun, and then uh, actually move um, um, at lower speeds and lower, lower velocities when it goes further away. So the same thing is here. Out here, this particular part of the disk is actually rotating um, you know, in, in, in terms of orbital rotations uh, slower than once you move closer in. And and as you can imagine, what happens when you have something that rotates really fast in the center compared to something that rotates less fast further out, 
is that these different parts of the disk actually rub against each other, and that makes it heat up. So it's basically viscosity processes that make this disk heat up. And it's so hot in the center, it's emitting an X-rays. Further out, UV, optical, and infrared emission. So when we see a quasar, the emission from a black hole, we, often it's, it's said that the, uh, the whole powerhouse is the black hole, and it is in the sense that it's not the black hole we're seeing, it's the accretion disk and all the gas around it that's trying to fall onto the black hole. But if it wasn't for the black hole, we wouldn't have the accretion disk, and it wouldn't be moving at such high speeds. So we have the black hole down here. We have this huge disk of uh, accreting matter that's moving fast and heating up and radiating again. And then we have, um, we think somewhere around here, we have some gas clouds that's moving really, really fast. Uh, because we're seeing, and I'll show you in a spectrum just in a minute, we're seeing signatures in some of our data that we have gas speeds that go from 2,000 to um, 100, uh, 10,000 kilometers a second. That's equivalent to uh, 7.2 million kilometers an hour to 36 million kilometers an hour. That's going pretty darn fast. <laughs> yeah, it's just a swell that police isn't around, right? <laughs> but um, sometimes some of these objects actually also have jets. So the, the black hole is also capable in some cases to make these very powerful jets that are emitting plasma, just electron, electrons and positrons, out, or um, uh, protons, I'm sorry, out to large, large distances, way out of the galaxy. And um, so this is all moving at a relativistic speeds. Um, so in only some cases that we see this. Okay. Now, if you were to take the light from our quasar and put it through a prism, you'll see something like this. So what this shows you is the intensity on this axis as a function of energy, wavelength, or color. And this is sort of um, orange, green, blue. This is very ultraviolet. And it's showing, interestingly, that we have different transitions that it's actually different atomic transitions or ionic transitions. And we see that we have some nitrogen, a certain transition there. We have some oxygen. We have some silicon, carbon, magnesium. What else? I think that's about it. And this is hydrogen oxygen again. So we can see there's heavy metals. There's actually some uh, um, heavier elements that from, you know, we have hydrogen, but we also have helium. We have uh, different metals like um, the carbon and sulfur. Yeah, we call them metals. You know, go figure. Um, this is a metal, definitely. But we see these transitions, so we know that there are some uh, chemical elements that's heavier than, than hydrogen. So there has been some star, star formation that's actually generated these uh, heavy elements. And um, not only that, but these lines are so broad, it tells us the gas is moving at very, very high speeds. Now, this line out here has a speed equivalent to that of the stars in the galaxy. And it's actually thicker than I could really draw it in, in like, a, like it really ought to be. Um, but this, this is actually from the, the speed of the stars, it's razor thin. So when in comparison here, you can see that these speeds are really, really large. So we have this gas that's just moving around at really high speeds. Okay. Um, 